Today I start a series of three recorded therapy sessions with a client who was willing to participate in this project. Uh, I do this because I regularly have clients that start with therapy and uh, have never done any sort of counseling or therapy sessions before. And they often come with unrealistic expectations. Um, they think that something uh, very strange or uh, unusual is happening in these conversations. Whereas in most cases, therapy conversations are normal conversations that are just focused on the experience of the client. Sometimes, of course, specific techniques are used, but often enough, and at least in the way that I work, I try to use as much as possible a normal style of conversation that is not too artificial in order to support the client to get more clarity in the issues. I agree with that client, of course, to anonymity. I will call her Anna for the sake of uh, just having a name to address her. And uh, we agreed on a set of three sessions, each one hour long. Each one hour session I will split up in two parts for the convenience of the audience. So that will in total make uh, six recordings that I will publish on my podcast. Of course, these recordings are not completely natural therapy sessions because both of us know that those sessions are recorded. Sometimes I make more comments than I would usually make for the audience to get an additional understanding of the direction that I want to steer our conversations to. Basically, keep in mind that this is, apart from a very brief conversation that I had with this client for the preparation, and to clarify the basics of uh, this recording. Apart from that, this is our first real therapeutic interaction. And what I often do is I try to go into different directions. I try to get to know the client and their motivations, their style of communication, the way they process. And sometimes I make suggestions uh, and use metaphors and this gives me a valuable insight into how that processing style is. And you will see, I guess, with the following recordings that my understanding of the client deepens and that there is a better alignment of our different styles and an understanding of in which direction to go. So this is a normal process because you just have to keep in mind that in order to create such an intimate therapeutic development where the client has the trust to open up, they need to see the resonance in the therapist. I have agreed with a client to focus on the expat experience of living abroad and the alienation that comes with that specifically with the, the family that has stayed at home. In this case, it is in the United States. And what issues that creates in, in us and the expats that have moved away and need to coordinate a life in the country that they live now and the coordination with the people who have stayed at home, in quotes. Uh, because, of course, our idea of what home is has diversified and has changed with our moving away. Welcome, as I call you, Anna, for our demonstration session, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The idea is to let an interested audience participate in what a more or less realistic therapeutic situation would be. We had uh, as a disclaimer, disclaimer we had a short uh, conversation before uh, as preparation and uh, i just checked a little bit your background and we reflected a little bit on what might be worthwhile discussing about mm -hmm. um, so this is what we have done before but other than that we don't know each other and certainly we have not spoken in length about uh, more detailed topics of yours. Um, you are currently residing in Central Europe, right? You have 
mm -hmm. a son in uh, his early teens. You are in your in 30s. Uh, basically, the family situation is, or the background is, as far as I remember and understood, originally you are from the U.S. Uh, you met someone uh, in the U.S. who comes from uh, Central Europe. You got together, married. Uh, you moved with him uh, to the country that you're still residing in now. Uh, and that was after you gave birth, as far as I understood. So shortly after you gave birth, you moved. Um, oh, uh, um, yes. I gave birth. I gave birth here in cent in <laughs> Central Europe. Uh -huh. oh, okay. I, 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 yeah. All right. And then you've been briefly to the U.S. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay. And then, then you came back. Thank you for the correction. And uh, about two years after giving birth, you divorced. Uh, but you decided to stay in the same country for most of the time. Uh, and that was about 10 years ago, if I did the math correctly. Right. And uh, since then, you have been uh, in, uh, so sometime afterwards, you started a long-term relationship with your current partner. And uh, you are not living together, but mm -hmm. he is, as far as I understood, quite well integrated into your life and also in the life of your son. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's good <laughs> so um, we discussed briefly, as I mentioned, uh, some topics, and I'm sure you had some time to reflect on it. What would you like to focus on? What would you like to start with? Um, well, I, is it cliche to say that we should start with my childhood? <laughs> is it like it is, <laughs> it is not cliche because whatever okay. feels like the important thing to do is the important thing to do. It, it always goes there, right? Yes. Um, I guess, you know, I, I would like to examine who I was in America versus who I am today in, in Central Europe. Uh, I haven't been home in, in like six years. So... Um, I, you know, I'm, I, sometimes you go through like this identity crisis as an, as a foreigner. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a bit of that and, and my connection with my family, like I, I don't talk to them very much mm. and, you know, it's not, no, it's not any fault of theirs either. It's not like I'm angry with them or they're bad people. It's, it's far from it. I love them and, and I miss them, but I guess living here, it, like it's so easy for me to just cut them off and not confront things. So I feel like maybe I'm hiding a bit uh, of who I am mm -hmm. by, by staying here. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting that you said home when referring to the US. Do you still yeah. consider it home? You know, this is the thing. Uh, and I was talking about this with, with some friends that, um, Six years ago, I was I was living with my parents in my parents' house, and that to me was like home because I had known that place for like 20 years, and, and it was just like a constant, like no matter where I was, I could always go there. But then after I moved back here, my parents sold their house, and uh, they're living somewhere else, and now I don't, like, like my last memory of being there was being in that house and that was home and now I don't have that and I haven't gone back since after that so I don't know how I'm going to feel going back to home and it's not really home yes you know so what you refer to is uh, is an interesting phenomenon because um for a good amount of people I guess and especially if they have a uh, kind of diverse background um the the past that they're coming from is not does not exist anymore in that sense i mean of course kind yeah. of a little bit philosophically we understand that nothing stays the same but still for us for our memory and for our self-identity uh location matters and where we grew up and the places that we associate with our childhood with our upbringing and so on uh they are somewhat fixed in our memory and yeah. when 
those places are not there anymore, then it's uh, odd for our self-identity to uh, mm -hmm. reflect on who we are in this fragmented uh, setup that our life and our past life has become. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And it's so much easier for people who don't have that, right? Where basically there is an intact background where still the parents are mm -hmm. together. It's more or less the same city. Yeah. Uh, there's still a family house so that so much of um, of the past comes back when we go and visit. There is right. actually there is another aspect to it, which might sound uh, not so positive. An effect of this going back is what we call regression, which means that we in our minds, we become younger again, to a certain extent, mm. and sometimes even children. So we go to, you know, to the home country, to the home house, we go up the, you know, the stairs, we open the door, and suddenly we feel younger, and we act younger. The wow. negative aspect of that is that parents, you know, when they annoy us, they have to say one thing, it's like, don't forget your coat, it's cold outside, and then <laughs> we explode because yeah. we're not a child yeah. anymore, and of course, we behave childish exactly at that moment. Yes because we lose the, our temper in a way that we usually don't anymore. And that mm -hmm. kind of makes us feel awkward. So there is this kind of double uh, phenomenon there that it gives us uh, kind of strength and identity, the background mm -hmm. and the memories, but it also keeps us from moving on. And what you describe mm -hmm. is, I think, a set of circumstances that forced you to move on. Yeah. Uh, both kind of in, in the trajectory that your life uh, had with kind of moving away and having a son abroad, um, but also, as you described, uh, when your parents uh, moved away from their house so that you don't know yeah. the house anymore. So how do you have... feel about uh, this maybe having to mature in a way that you didn't want to because it meant to give up the idea of house or home. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, it was hard for me because um, big parts of my childhood was moving. We moved a lot. Mm. So that's another thing where, mm. you know, I mean, I, I went to, I think, four different high schools or something. And I didn't even go to my high school graduation because I, I didn't feel connected to, to where I was. Yeah. So I was always moving and um, in different family situations, too. Like I was in one house and then another house in one state and another state. And so the last 20 something years, having that that family house, my parents house was like a big deal because it was mm. a place that I, I was I felt constant. And now it's not there. And and then when I go back. Well, the last time when I went back, I, I think I behaved in the way that you described as well. I was living with my parents and, and, you know, I think parents do this too, to you. They, they treat you like a kid because you're always a kid for them, right? Yeah. You're always their baby. Um, and I felt like I was uh, mentally much younger than when I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it wasn't a comfortable situation to be raising your own child in that because it was like, I have to be the adult, you know, for my son. I have, you know, yes. I can't relive this stuff. My my kid needs to have his childhood, you know. So that's why I, one of the reasons why I went back here, because it, it's far from there and I can just focus on him hmm. and not other things. Was it important yeah. for you when you settled? Uh, and maybe especially after your divorce to create some sort of a nest, a safe haven. Is that something that was important to you? Yeah, 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 definitely. But it's like, if I'm in one place for more than two years, I get nervous. Hmm. Okay. It's like unsettled. Like, like I've been in this apartment <clears throat> probably for almost three years now. And it's a big deal for me. And I'm, and I don't know if I should stay comfortable here. Like I get, I feel guilty if I put up a picture on a wall, like, I don't know. 
Like I just fixed up my balcony and it's a big, big deal. It took over two and a half years to do something like that. And by doing that, am I saying, okay, you're going to be here for a while. I don't know. <laughs> yes. I don't know. And is that due to the fact that you, I assume you don't own the apartment, you rent? Is that no, no, no. Yeah, I rent. I like it. I love this place. I feel good here. <clears> my son place, likes would it. Would that be different? Would you be more comfortable to hang up pictures? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd feel more like, okay, this is, I'm going to make this my home. But I don't know if I can mentally see myself anywhere for more than a few years. Yes. Like it's never happened. So I don't know. Well, I mean, also you are in the, you're an interested, interesting kind of crossroads, I think, in your life, also age wise, biographically. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are things that change at that time. And uh, mm -hmm. also with your son, it's probably will become much more important in the, few, in the next few years when he will become more and more mm -hmm. independent. And yeah you will notice and also feel that you are less of a mother to him that than you have been in the past, which mm -hmm. besides again, you being a person and not so much in this dyad of a mother son existential relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, not that he, he will be mature yet, but he will hang out with his friends and will be interested in right. all kinds of things. So you will have to change and you're already changing for, for mm -hmm. these reasons only. And the question that I hear from you is, what should I do with this program, with this habit that I have acquired from the past, which is this frequent movement? Is that part of yeah. me? Should I continue it for the sake of it because I got used to it? Or mm -hmm. is it time to kind of question that, what the purpose of this is and whatever good it made, uh, maybe I can have it in different ways than other than just constantly moving around? Yeah, yeah. It, it's really interesting to to think of myself as being settled somewhere because people ask me all the time, um, are you going to move back to America, right? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing next week. I, I have no idea. I didn't know I was going to live in, in, in Central Europe um, for as long as I have. I, I mean, I don't know. And so I, I never make concrete plans for the future because who knows? Yeah. Well, interesting so. here for me is, so you mentioned that uh, your family has moved with you. Uh, it sounds like during the early years. So in high school years, right. you changed. Yeah, yeah. We changed. That, looking back, I mean, obviously you made somewhat a habit out of it, of the moving, but back then, do you remember if it was difficult for you to move? It was, it was, it, yeah, it was, of course, as, as a kid, but I'm, I'm the eldest of, um, I, of three. So I have a brother and sister and every time we had to move because I was the eldest one, I had to be, I had to show my brother and sister that it's okay. So my parents would have, yeah, like, you know, tell them that, you know, tell them that, um, mm -hmm it's going to be fine. And, and I never had a chance to really process how I felt about it yes. because I always had to be responsible for everybody yes. else. So, yes, you know, That's... but it, I did not like it. <laughs> right. yeah. So having said that, how do you feel about potentially putting your son in that situation? Because you, you oh, say, yeah. well, I don't know what next week brings, maybe yeah. Yeah. Next month, next year, who knows, but that would imply also to rip your son away from his environment. So is that mm -hmm. not a factor that would automatically make you more conservative? Or is that something that you would be more casual about? Yeah. No, I, I definitely it's always there. That I mean, that's why when he, we I because I had moved back to America for like one year, and then I made the decision to to change his life, you know, because he was at an age where he could adjust, you yes. know, and I knew that. But I said to to my family that the choice I'm making, I'm taking him back to Central Europe. That that's it. Like I'm not, I'm not going to come back then because yeah. I don't want him to be confused. And so mm -hmm. he was able to readjust to life here, 
And that's why I know for sure I'm not going back to America to live for the next eight years until this child <laughs> is in college or whatever. And um, because I don't want him to experience what I experienced. Yes. You know? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's quite interesting because y you said something now in clarity, considering your son that you could not have said about yourself a few sentences ago, because you were just yeah. thinking about yourself and about how you feel kind of from within. And I think you expressed that, well, when I look within, there's not much that tells me if I should stay or go. It's like, I'm yeah. following the circumstances, but then when we shifted yeah. uh, kind of our perspective a little bit and brought your son is, and then you said, oh no, for the next years, I will not move. <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess when I'm, th when I'm thinking about him, I'm more like, let's, let's be responsible and, and think about, you know, this mm -hmm. child. And then when I have to think about myself and just, I don't know, it's, it's harder. Yes. Right. Uh, and this is just a comment also for the audi audience. It's 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 difficult to think about oneself, right? Because uh, the most important when I think about someone else, I see them from the outside, right? So mm -hmm. I see their appearance and how it has changed. Uh, I have a flattened version of what they went through, right? Some biographical data, some experiences that we've had together, and we compile you know, a personality out of this data. And it's relatively mm -hmm. simple. I can create a persona uh, of someone that I meant only five minutes ago, because I just create an image out of them. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, she's uh, well educated, he's dumb, she's superficial, like we make those judgments all the time. So we have no issue to create this uh, kind of image about someone else. When we look at ourselves, we have a very different set of data. We don't mm -hmm. have such a convenient flattened version of ourselves because we have an overwhelming amount of information. Each moment, we don't even know exactly what we're going through because we are so ambivalent about so many decisions we have to take, right? So yeah. what I want to say with that is it, it's even wrong to expect from oneself that I should know myself in a similar way as I know someone who I know very well from the outside, mm -hmm. a friend or a partner or family member, or even my son, my kid, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we look inside, it's quite fragmented, chaotic, ambivalent in many respects. So when we come to those questions of who am I, where do I want to go? We need other criteria. We cannot mm -hmm. just look inside because the inside is not very telling. Uh, we might hope for an inner voice that is full of clarity and says, you're staying in Europe for the yeah. next five years, you should buy an apartment. Yeah. In fact, many people, because we live in such complex uh, environments, especially, you know, if we are well educated and live in urban environments, it's an immensely complex life and our inside reflects that. And mm -hmm. so many people are yearning for this voice of intuition, the gut feeling that tells me what to do, because we would like to uh, delegate this responsibility to the wise voice inside that knows what I should do. We would love that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. many people are quite desperate or, you know, they are, they are kind of, they feel overburdened with decision making because they don't have that. Mm -hmm. They feel they have to compile each and every difficult decision out of you know from scratch yeah um so what should we do about mm -hmm. that right so one of the aspects um there that is uh, i think helpful we have to look at other criteria not to the inside not necessarily to a gut feeling not to emotions but for example to set up and setting right mm -hmm. how is job satisfaction how is career satisfaction how is we just mentioned before, how is my situation family wise with my son and to take when there is a clear picture emerging out of that to take that as again, not, you know, as set in stone or as the authoritative voice, but to take this as a clear indication of what I should consider as maybe the default uh, kind of answer to my question and then mm -hmm. to take it from there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so how do you feel about if, if we take very literally what you said before, which is I will not move for the next eight years or so, uh, mm -hmm. or at least not change country. If you let that sink in and apply it to yourself, what would be the consequence of that in terms of real life decisions? Um, you mean for myself yes. uh, personally, not for my son, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I keep thinking about him. Like, well, it's good for for my son because he'll he'll have a con a place for his childhood. Um, for me, I think that it, career career wise, it's better here. I've had better projects and experiences here. I feel I feel happy being here generally. Mm -hmm. um, you but know, the there's perspective. So, does it change anything about the way that you think about your career or, for example, your living place, the apartment? Yeah. If you yeah. Really let, let it sink in that you said, I will stay here for the next eight years. What does it yeah, entail? It, um, well, OK, so it it makes me feel happy, but at the same time, really scared, especially that um, I have immigration issues and that's been a crazy journey hmm. and I feel like not completely accepted into this society yeah. so I, I again I feel like I'm not in where I, I sh where I want to be um like I'm, I'm always an outsider and, yes. and that's how I feel yes yeah, I just feel an outsider and here I would like to uh, bring in a question that might be relevant. When you lived in the U.S. for a short while, how many years ago mm -hmm. was that, by the way? Six years ago when I moved back, <clears throat> right. six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Did you feel so that was at that time you have lived uh, in Europe already for a while? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How did you feel about living in the U.S.? Did you feel that you belong, that you are no. integrated, that you're connected to the culture and everything no <laughs> mm -hmm. no and that was so hard that was hard and i even and this i was thinking about this the other day um i had a panic attack in a store and i was like and i've had a few of these in my life but um it was so weird i i went into uh you know a, a supermarket <clears throat> and they look like from the movies, you know, like very clean and like pristine mm. and lots of products and whatever. And um, I remember just feeling out of place and everything was like slow motion. And <laughs> I was walking past the the produce section for fruits and vegetables. And then uh, this automatic spraying system um, went off to like water down everything. And then it was uh, playing the song, Singing in the Rain. And it's just so, yeah. <laughs> and it's far cry from the places that I, I would shop here in Central yeah. Europe, you know, at the bazaar or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was shopping with my mom and my sister and I just, I had to go down another aisle away from them. And I remember like, my breathing got really fast and, and I got dizzy and I was just, I just wanted to run. I don't know why, like it's, it's so silly to think about because, you know, it's, I, I grew up with that. I shouldn't have reacted that way, it, you know, and, and I just felt so out of place. I didn't know the products. Um, and and my mom and my sister were, were like looking at me like, "What's wrong with you? Just you know, get go get some cheese." Or like they were, just, they didn't understand at all. And I was just like, "Oh, it's really overwhelming." Yeah. So there is, in many ways, in in your life, as I hear it, uh, there's a theme of alienation. Yeah. Um, which so that kind of it, it moves from uh, or it appears in several of the topics that we have had so far, which mm -hmm. is. The alienation from the US when you were there, the alienation yeah. or the not feeling fully integrated here in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and at the beginning of our com conversation, you mentioned that also that there is a distance to your family, right? That you yeah. cannot fully explain or describe what right. it is. So that uh, kind of leaves the, the impression in me that there is 
also as a, as a kind of consequence of this, there might be a theme of uh, isolation and maybe loneliness. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that? Yeah, yeah, there, I mean, there are moments where you feel very distant from people around you. Um, but thankfully, like in, in here, uh, I've built a nice community, let's say, of other um, expats. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they also share with me the same experiences. So through that, it, it helped me find my little like island mm -hmm. <laughs> of this, like community and um and we c we are we support each other so that helped a lot it was the first time that i felt part of something so you know um at least i have that but yeah growing up i i never felt completely integrated i always felt like an outsider to my family always Mm -hmm. I was always the black sheep, yeah. yeah. Um, and I couldn't handle it the last time I was living there. Like, like they they are they had already built this life without me and my son, and I just kind of I felt like I intruded on them, mm -hmm. you know. And it was easier. It's easier to be a foreigner in a foreign country than in your own country, right? Yes. I'm like, I'm, I'm supposed to be a can foreigner you, here. I'm not can you describe supposed that to be. I think that's very important what you said. I, I think I understand, but I would like to hear a bit more. Yeah. So like when I was in America, I didn't feel like, like I felt like such an outsider. And that upset me more than being an outsider in, in Central Europe. Because it's like, well, you're supposed to be an outsider here. I accept that identity. But if I go back to America, you're, well, I'm American and I'm supposed to be like, like ev these other people. And I, I just didn't connect at all with right. it. And part of that is, I guess, because you oh. were not part, I mean, you described it in other words, uh, but similarly, you were not part of the project. You did not co-build that society, yeah. you know, you did not yep. for many years, you have not participated in the yeah. common mindset of the people around you. You did not feed into it right mm -hmm. and when and i'm an expert myself so uh, i know this experience that many other uh, people mm -hmm. share when they move to another country you have to you have to build something up there is this feeling of especially in the first months and years that of course every discovery is is new uh in yeah. two degrees in two orders basically there's the the first order where something you know, as a new experience, as a new building, as a new house, as a new person. But additionally to that, this newness is accompanied by, uh, but if that is embedded in something familiar or not, and it's not, right? Mm -hmm. So I meet a new person, their behavior, I don't know, because it's someone that I just got to know. But it it is also clear to me that their points of reference is different than what I'm used to. So I have mm -hmm. to first figure out what is kind of the code uh, of uh, conduct, basically. Mm -hmm. What is insulting? What is pleasant chit chat around here? How do yeah. I kind of engage in uh, starting a friendship? How long does it do I have to wait until, you know, I open up about things about suggesting to meet, you know, not just in a group that I met, but to meet alone mm -hmm. maybe for a walk or invite someone over like, how does it work here or with that person, yeah. right? So this is an additional newness that mm -hmm. um, that is due to the fact that I live in a surrounding that is has not made itself transparent to me. So I built that up. It's a construction. It's a constructive process. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case when I go to my supposedly home country. I feel that everything is finished. Everything mm -hmm. is finished. Everyone is supposed to know how things work. But I'm the only sucker who doesn't. And I have to ask yeah. silly things. And they yeah. look at me as if I'm dumb or just weird because they think that I should mm -hmm. know. Don't you come right. from You should yes. know all these things. And I don't. And that makes me even more alienated mm -hmm. than when I at mm -hmm. least have those constructive acts and I can allow myself not to know in my mind. No, that's true. Like that's, and that is how I felt with my family. Like they just like, don't you know, you're supposed to go here for this mm -hmm. product or, um, 
you know, it, it, I just felt so stupid with them. Yeah. And it's not their fault. It's just that they, they just, they never left America. Like they, they have no idea where I'm coming from and, and how I'm thinking. Um, they would say things like, why are you? So this was the first part of our first therapy session with my client, Anna, uh, where she started to explore the topic of alienation from her country of origin, the U.S., and the alienation or friction with her family. Please tune in and come back for the second part of our first session on the Curious Mind podcast.